welcome back. Uh, hello there. His autobiography stormed to the top of the bestseller list when it was published last week and has caused a hurricane of headlines. And Tony Blair joins us now. Welcome. Welcome. This is Hi. quite nice and quiet in here, I would have thought. Aren't you worried that we're going to leap forward and perform some sort of <laughs> citizen's arrest on you? No, I'm sort of... <laughs> You're not. safe. It's it fun. might happen. It yeah, could happen. Never know. It could I, happen. Well, in, in my business, you get prepared for just about anything. So. <laughs> yeah. Let's start with... Uh, before we get onto the book, let's start with, uh, with things that are happening at the moment uh, in, in, the, in the newspapers, this sort of unfolding story. Um, uh, were you ever hacked, do you think, your phones? I haven't the faintest idea. Would you, I mean, you wouldn't have known? Was, anyone, was it ever discussed? Um, no, not really. I mean, I, you know, when you're Prime Minister, I think it's pretty unlikely, frankly. To get through the security? Yeah. I, actually, I never had a... Also, I never had a mobile phone. So, do you think it was for that reason, though, that maybe that's um, why you weren't ever given one? <laughs> it's probably my technological incapacity, <laughs> I should think. But it, it was... Um, no, I, funnily enough, now I think leaders have... And I actually use, of course, mobile phones and Blackberries and so on. Mm. But when I was in Downing Street, it was still a bit more, you know, you, di you didn't have that type of technology. So I doubt very much whether some... They would have had to have hacked into the Downing Street switchboard, and I suspect that's pretty impossible. So it never do. showed... Whilst you were, were in Downing Street, it never showed up on your radar? Not... I mean, it showed up on my radar because it was being discussed, I think, but, but not in relation to me, really. And if you were Prime Minister now and it was happening on your watch, this was all going on, what would you do? I mean, you, you've just got to let the, the authorities you know, investigate it, because mm. obviously it's serious if it's happening. But, but I, you, the, the thing with, with these types of situations is, and you got used to dealing with them the whole time, you just never know. Yeah. So you're best to say to someone, go and investigate it, give me a report, and then I'll see what to do on it. Would you feel comfortable with Andy Coulson around you? Um, I don't, you know, I had enough trouble with my own people, I don't want to comment on... It's up to David Cameron who he employs, and that's fine by me. What's, um, what's happening this evening? Because we know that the, um, that the, the book signing today was cancelled because of potential civil unrest, um, which has followed you from Dublin. Um, what about the party tonight? You know, we're, we're, we're getting reports that the party's been cancelled. We just put the whole thing off, really. Because it, it's, look, it's, it's sad in a way, because it's, mm. you know, in a sense, you, you should have the right to sign books or see your friends if you want to do it. But it was going to cause so much hassle. And for the people at the party tonight who have friends and some of them not political at all, I mean, I don't mind going through protests. I've lived with that all my, all my political life. But for other people, it can be a bit unpleasant and a bit frightening, actually. So it's, it's supposed to be a, a nice occasion. So if it's not going to be that, there's no point in there's doing more important Were you surprised things to do. about the reaction? I mean, obviously, when you write something like this, you know that certain feathers are going to be ruffled in places. But mm. are you surprised that...? No, not, not at all. I mean, essentially... One of the things that happens, I write about this in the book, actually, is that nowadays, even if a small number of people make a protest, the visible impact of that, you know, people throwing things and shouting, it always kind of takes the news. But like in Dublin, you know, there were a small group of protesters, mm. but then there were hundreds of people coming to get the book signed and being very friendly. Mm. So it, it's, but, it, but it always happens like that, you know, it's just the way it is. So, so does that mean that the, that the party is cancelled or just postponed? Uh, we'll postpone it to another time. You'll do it again? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I'd like to say thank you to the people that worked on the book and this type of thing. You know, there's lots of people who work for you, and they very rarely get the chance to be sort of brought into a party and, you know, say thank you for all you did. And all these mm. people... I mean, now I've actually published a book, I know what goes on behind the scenes. There are all these people burying away doing all this work. So it's nice to, to, to recognise them. But Was there a point when you thought, oh, do you know what, I'm just not going to publish a book because it's going to be so much hassle and I don't need to do it? Um, not really, because I think the thing with these, these folk, as I say, you know, one of the things you learn in, in politics, actually in life, I think, is that those that shout loudest don't necessarily deserve to be heard most. You know, there's most people... I mean, I find, you know, most people, even if they disagree with me very strongly, are reasonable and pleasant, and they may say, I totally disagree with you about this or that, mm. but they don't feel the need to kind of throw something at you, you know? So I think you've got to be very careful of mistaking those types of people yeah. for the whole of well, the country. you say or... in the book, you say there is a certain sadness that settles on you that never leaves. And I can imagine that the, 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 the pressure and, and that sometimes the loneliness of office must, there must be, and, and decisions that you have to make, mistakes that are made. And I think you said that because Allied forces had, had, had bombed a convoy in Kosovo and children had been killed. Um, but, but one of the things that was shouted out at you in Dublin uh, was, hey, hey, Tony, hey, how many kids have you killed today? Now, there, there's, no, there's no sense of that sadness 
lifting, I would have thought, if, if, if people shout something like that at you. How does that make you feel? It's not those people shouting it, because in a sense they come at it from a very particular point of view. And actually, the truth is that people that have died, for example, in Iraq have basically been killed by terrorism, you know, not by, by us. But there is a sense in which when, you know, I came in, I think you were showing the pictures of me coming in in 1997, uh, looking rather younger than I look Euph today. But euphoric. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And if you'd said to me as I came in that door, actually, your premiership is going to be dominated to the extent it became after 9-11, and even before that, actually. You'll take us into four wars. Yeah, I would have said, oh, my goodness, what on earth? You know, but that's the way it is with the job. And you never know what's going to happen. And when you take life and death decisions, which I did first of all over Kosovo and then in Sierra Leone, actually, um, I think there is a sadness that ne never leaves you mm. after that. And you, look, you, you, it's an honor to do the job and a privilege to do it. And as Sheree always used to say to me when I would complain sometimes, you know, about the media stuff, she'd say, look, it's voluntary, so it's a privilege. And get out and do it. And you had a decision that you had to make, um, which I, I, I read with horror, was that after 9-11, uh, any planes that lost contact over London, uh, they, they, you had to be phoned by the intelligence services, the military, and mm. say, you have to make a decision now. We can't contact this plane. We might have to shoot it down. It's a passenger plane. And that's, that's fine to hear, but to, but to do, and you got a phone call saying, we have lost contact with an aeroplane over yeah. London. What was that like for you? Um... Frightening, really, really frightening. Because I, I, I mean, I remember it was it was a Saturday morning, and I was just called into the, the study to take the call, and and I was trying to get a feel, you know, because I mean, right, your every sense tells you, look, it's probably a technical fall, mm. or they've you, they've just lost contact, but we'd actually gone up, you know, they only come to me when it's, you're Serious. very close to decision point. Um, and I was, I remember talking to the Air Force commander, just trying both of us to, to get a, just an instinct at least as to what, what this was. And in the end, um, I said, no, just leave it that bit longer. And literally within a few minutes mm -hmm. after that, um, they regained, it had been some technical fault. How did you feel when you put the phone down? I was pretty shaken, actually. Yeah. Not surprised. You know, because the, 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 the dangerous thing is that, that if, obviously, if you shot the plane down, many, many people would have died. But but if a plane was then driven into a building, which is, of course, what they did in 9-11, in then many more people mm. could have died. So you're left with this horrible decision. But, and that's what the job's like in the end. I mean, you, you do get these decisions. And one of the things I've tried to do in the book is to write it in a very kind of human way from the point of view of what's it like to be an ordinary person. Because we are, in the end, politicians, believe it or not, are ordinary people. You know, little, like you guys like anybody, um, what's it like to be an ordinary human being at the centre of extraordinary events and decisions?